Welcome everyone to the second annual Omar Aliyah, a seven week spiritual boot camp of personal elevation or simply known as TOA. This is the fifth class of our seven class empowerment series. My name is Nuri El Shor, and in partnership with Hashem, I'm the founder of the Omar Aliyah. Welcome to participants from the United States, Canada, Israel, England, Australia, and Uganda who have joined us on this journey of holy transformation and spiritual evolution. The vision is for all Jews of all backgrounds around the world to be part of a global movement of revealing our individual and collective greatness through Svirat to Omer, the counting of the Omer. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank and recognize our sponsors of this initiative. Without their support, this, uh, this initiative would not be complimentary to all participants, and simultaneously, it allows it to be sustainable long term. I'd also like to take an opportunity to recognize our community partners who are, are affiliated with this movement. And you'll notice that um, not all of the organizations are self-identified as Orthodox. As I mentioned before, this is a Kla Yisrael movement. Anybody that wants to connect to the light of Toha is welcome to join. For those of you who are interested in participating as a sponsor or as a community partner, you can email me at omeraliyah at gmail.com. The mission of the Omer Aliyah is to serve as a spiritual detox of the klipot, the barriers that are preventing us from accessing Hashem and our highest selves while simultaneously building a foundation of spiritual power. Practically speaking, the essence of the Omer Aliyah is tikkun hamidot, repairing, refining, and elevating our character attributes based on these lower seven spirot, which correspond to the seven weeks. By emulating these divine attributes, we transform into conduits of peace, love and blessing for ourselves, for others, and for all creation. The structure of the boot camp consists of about four in-person community gatherings in Los Angeles, seven virtual empowerment classes taught by seven teachers, and 49 days of individual learning and growth. For more information on the Omer Aliyah or to start your own TOA community wherever you are in the world, email me at omeraliyah at gmail.com. We're concluding the week of Hod, and we have the zechut of having Rabbi Simon Jacobson, Rabbi Jacobson is a pioneering speaker, educator, and mentor to thousands across the world. He is the author of the best-selling book, Toward a Meaningful Life, which has sold over 400,000 copies to date. Rabbi Jacobson heads the Meaningful Life Center, which bridges the secular and the spiritual through a wide variety of live and online programming, presenting the universal teachings of Torah as a blueprint for life to people of all backgrounds. Rabbi Jacobson is also the author of a fantastic Svirat de Omer resource, a booklet called Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping remarks. This class is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Omer Aliyah YouTube channel. So please hold all your questions and comments until after the class finishes. I will then stop the recording, after which we will have an opportunity for open and confidential conversation with Rabbi Jacobson. May Hashem bless the Umar Aliyah and all who are involved so that Kai Saul may discover the greatness within and bring about individual, collective, and global Gaula speedily in our days. I now hand the class over to you, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you so much and welcome, everyone. It's a true honor and pleasure to be here with you. Such a noble cause, Omar Aliyah. The very idea of self-refinement, character development, personality growth in this unique and special time period, as you so eloquently described. So I commend you for your work and I commend all of you and uh, by extension, everyone that we will reach in this uh, majestic uh, effort. Just by means of introduction, it was around uh, probably 25 years ago, I was giving a class in New York City where I am based. The Meaningful Life Center had just been born as an outgrowth of my book, Toward a Meaningful Life. And it was during this period of time between Passover and Shavuot, Pesach and Shavuot, when we count the Omer, that one of the people in the class came over to me and said, you know, I was in synagogue and I saw and showed me how to count each night, night one, two, three, 
all the way till the last 49th day before, before the holiday of Shavuot. And I saw, I noticed that on each day, it says in small words, Hebrew terms that refer to chesed shebe chesed, gvura shebe chesed, tiferet shebe chesed. Essentially, I asked someone, what is this? And they told me these are emotional attributes, divine attributes, and human beings trying to emulate Hashem's personality, so to speak. So we have chesed is kindness, and then gvura is discipline. And when he began to ask around, what are the each details? He said, most people said, we can only tell you some general broad strokes. I don't know, but we don't know the details. So he asked me, he said, since you're giving a class every week, would you perhaps go through each of these seven attributes and seven times seven, which makes 49, so we can understand what we're supposed to be doing each day. Very interesting challenge, which I took on in a very... <laughs> eager way, and I began to research it. I asked some of my teachers and friends and colleagues and scholars, and frankly, most people could only identify three or four general in general terms. Chesed, Gvura, but not the details. What is Gvura Shebet Teferet? What is Hoi Shebet Netzach? And so on. So I decided to give out a handout. So every week I would come with a printout, give it out to the class, and then people ask me permission if they can copy it. And they started copying, just plain photocopies. After a few years, a designer came over to me and said, do you mind if I put it together in a booklet? <laughs> and I said, sure, absolutely. So many people ask me, I mean, they're making these photocopies. They're, you know, the copies are always, they're loose pages. They, they, people lose them. And indeed, Ray Ekman was her name, a beautiful graphic designer. And this is what she designed. I'll show you the book, the one that you just made mention of, Spiritual Guide to Counting the Armor, in a very rustic, very earthy type of look, a booklet that goes through each of the 49 days. And this became a very popular book, which is so much the theme of um, Omar Aliyah. So I, I, can't, I couldn't resist the temptation to give some of that background because it's so fascinating to me that uh, this book has gotten around on hundreds of thousands of copies. Recently, we also started an Omer app free Omer app called My Omer. So to complement everything we'll be talking about and that you've been doing through this journey, this is, the, this is my small contribution. So with that said, as a somewhat give you my credentials regarding Omer and my work on it, I found fascinating insights that go back thousands of years. Because mind you, counting the Omer is not a new mitzvah. It's not been done for last year, two years. It's actually a commandment in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, in chapter, the chapter called Emer, that we read uh, a week ago, is there, there's an entire chapter, that, that a, a verse that says, the Sefatim Lachem, you shall count 49 days, seven weeks. And hence we have this mitzvah, but it's more than just counting, it actually is refinement. And that leads me into what we'll be discussing, the refinement for this week. Hod, as you mentioned, the, the transition from Hod to Yisod. I'll be talking about Hod, and uh, by another means of Shmord introduction, the word Sefira, which means to count, Vesfartem Lachem, you shall count, also has two other meanings. It also comes from the word in Hebrew, Sipur, which means to tell a story. Lesaper is to relate a story, a narrative. And also from the word Sapir, which is in Hebrew, Sapphire Stone, an illum a luminous, transparent stone that shines, that glows. So indeed, counting the Omer is seen not just as a number counter, but it's actually telling a story, the story of our own lives, the story of your psyche, the story of your soul, because your soul is made up of these seven emotional attributes. And more than just telling a story, it also illuminates. Each day illuminates another dimension within ourselves. So in essence, each of the seven weeks is structured to align itself with the spectrum of our emotional infrastructure, our emotional building blocks. So you've discussed, and we've already gone through chesed, kindness, and gvura, discipline, and teferet, which is compassion, and netzach, endurance, or ambition. So now we are, in the fifth week, is the week of hod. So let's translate the word, and let's see how this, this count, what story does it tell about our lives? What 
does it illuminate about our personality? And what can we do to both improve, enhance, and also repair, if necessary, any flaws in our own hod? So it's actually a soul-searching, introspective exercise, which is both illuminating and storytelling that it really will reveal a part of ourselves that often, if you don't focus or concentrate on it, you may neglect or ignore. So what does hod mean? So the word hod has several meanings. Sometimes you hear the word hod means splendor. It's another word for beauty. Hoyid v'hodar, beautiful, splendorous. But hod also has another word. It comes from the root hoda'a in Hebrew. Hoda'a, like we say every morning, moda'ani, the word moda, I acknowledge, or modim, or hodu, or the fourth of the 12 tribes, what was his name? Yehuda. Yehuda comes from the word hoda, oda, I acknowledge. So, so hod comes from the word acknowledging, basically recognizing the gifts of our life and also expressing gratitude. When I say, I acknowledge, I thank you. Means, I thank you, the divine, for returning my soul to me. So hod is really a tremendous attribute in life that is critical for any successful, healthy living. But it's important to really appreciate how let's compare it to its so-called twin cousin, <laughs> twin, which is Netzach. Remember, prior to Hod was Netzach. So in this sporadic structure, the way the Kabbalists explain it, you have the spheres are not just seven emotions, they're actually structured like the human body, right, left, and center. With chesed being kindness is on the right, judgment or severity or discipline on the left, the ferret, compassion in the center. Netzach is on the right. Hod is on the left. And then comes the third. The sixth week will be Yesod. And then finally Malchut. But we're focusing on Hod. So Netzach and Hod are essentially counter forces that complement each other. So Netzach literally means victory. What it refers to is that emotional attribute of determination, ambition, drive, persistence. But we all know that if a person has a lot of ambition and drive, it needs to be tempered because we can step on each other when we're very driven. We sometimes neglect to be sensitive. So hold is the counterforce. In a sense, if, if uh, Netzach is like the gas, hold is like the brakes. So what hold does is essentially it creates a balance that when you have drive and determination, you also have to have humility. Think of a relationship. Two people love each other. So love requires a certain measure of determination and persistence and seeing it through and not retreating. But love also requires yielding. There's a beautiful statement in the Talmud that says, the oilam, a person should always be rach kakane, should always be flexible, soft like a reed, and not altehe kosha keeres. Do not be hard and inflexible like a cedar tree. So when the storm strikes, what happens? Something that's very strong and standing strong, it could withhold certain winds. But since it's not flexible, it could also break in the wind. It could also crash. So a reed goes with the wind. It's flexible. So basically, Hodes represents the idea of humility, acknowledgement, gratitude, yielding, a critical emotion in each person's life. And it's important to emphasize, in our society especially, very often when people are humble or they are yielding, it can sometimes be misunderstood as being weakness. Because someone who's really determined and fighting for something, that's respected. But the truth is, healthy yielding is actually one of our most powerful forces. It should never be confused with weakness. So let me explain. Let's talk about the, the virtue of humility which is really the essence of what Hod is about. Humility, as I said, acknowledgement, gratitude, yielding. What really lies behind it? So in the Bible, in the Torah, we find who, what, when Moses is described, he's described one of the descriptions is that he was the humblest man that ever walked on earth. 
the humblest man that ever walked on this earth. What does that mean, humility? So in uh, Hasidic texts, when they explain the concept of humility, it co they contrast it with low self-esteem. Not to be confused. They're as far and distant from each other as possible. Someone with low self-esteem actually thinks that they're worthless. They feel they're, they don't have any value. And sometimes a person loathes themselves. It's a, a person of being a doormat. Humility is something very different. Humility, Moses knew his qualities. He knew he was chosen by God. He, he knew that he was a leader. He knew his powers. But why was he the humblest man? Because he said to himself, these are not my gifts. They were given to me. I was blessed with these gifts. I was blessed with this appointment. It never got to his head. And then he said to himself, if someone else was blessed with the same gifts, they would do better than I. So humility is recognizing your strengths. It's not the demoralizing element of someone of low self-esteem. It's someone that very much recognizes what their powers are, their strengths, but does not feel they're a self-made person. Always acknowledging these are given to me. It's a gift. And I show gratitude to God. I show gratitude to my parents. I show gratitude to those that have helped shape me, teach me, educate me, mentor me, and help me mold me into the person I am. So this is a fascinating feature because on one hand, it's not weakness at all. On the other hand, the greatest strength of all is that you don't always have to be aggressive. You don't always have to be pronounced. Sometimes yielding is the greatest strength of all, like I mentioned before with the reed. The reed can withstand any storm precisely because it knows how to yield. I remember when we were children, we were going in, in summer camp, they took us on a hike. And we went on top of a bridge called a, an, a, a, um, a uh, it was a expansive bridge, a bridge, a, uh, a, um, the bridges that are held up by wires, not a built bridge that's built into the water. And we were walking on this bridge. The bridge was shaking because the cars and the trucks that were driving it were shaking. And I remember our counselor telling us, you think the bridge is weaker because it's shaking. It's not true. The way it's built, in order to absorb more of the pressure and the tension, they build the bridge that it yields and is flexible with the wind, with the weight that's upon it. If the bridge was so inflexible, a certain amount of weight would cause it to crash. And it was fascinating. If you know something about oriental martial arts, one of the ways is not that you use your own strength. You allow the other person, your opponent, to use their energy and use it against them. In other words, your yielding actually makes you much more powerful. So how does this quality, the quality of being able to step back and not always get your way and actually yield and recognize in a sense of deep gratitude and deep thanks, acknowledging the blessings in our lives. It's one of the qualities that is sometimes underappreciated in our society, like I mentioned before, because people feel we live in a world, dog eats dog. If I don't fight for myself, no one will fight for me. So it's an underappreciated quality, this quality of humility. But frankly, it is humility and modesty that allows us to reach heights that there's no way we ever could have reached any other way. Because it opens up the door to all types of growth. Imagine a brilliant person, no matter how smart they are. So they have a lot of energy and they have a lot of intelligence and they have a lot to give. But that's that. When a person feels empty, they feel ready to absorb something greater than they are, that's hoid, the concept of hod, of allowing yourself to experience something greater than yourself. That is the general principle, and it's a, and this week of hod that we're concluding and we're going from hod into yasod, is to focus the soul search and understanding the hod within our lives. So it's a good question to ask yourself. You may be a very determined person. But do you know when to yield? Do you know when to let go? Or do, you, or do you step on others? Do you impose yourself with all your strength? Do you have the, necessity, the necessary modesty in everything that you're doing? So it's not contradicting Netzach. It's not contradicting Netzach and power and, and drive. It's, it's balancing it. It's taming it. It's harnessing that drive into something that is productive. Like I said earlier, in every relationship, you need to have an element of drive. You need to be driven. You need to be um, sometimes strong. 
and you need to want, know what you want, but you also have to know when to yield. When your partner says something, even if you may disagree, respect is part of Hayd, the respecting of another opinion. Think about the world in which we live in today. A lot of polarization. People don't, can't even argue. They can't even talk. We can't even disagree properly because slacking is an element of hod, that idea. Now, to bring it to the Jewish level, one of the names for a Jew is Yehudi. Look in the Megillah, the story of Esther, the story of Purim, which says Mordechai Yehudi, Mordechai the Jew. And the entire Megillah of Purim, the story of Purim, all uses the name Yehudi. And the Talmud tells us why, because Yehudi comes from the word Hayd, which is to acknowledge. What, are you, what is a Jew acknowledging? God. Acknowledging God. So when Mordechai met Haman, and everybody was bowing to him, it says, He does not bow to him, because a Jew bows to only one God. We don't bow to human beings, and we don't bow to, bow to human conventions. Now, it infuriated Haman, and infuriated many people who felt that, they're self that they felt they were gods, self-made individuals. But Yehudi represents that we acknowledge and are servants only of the Creator, only of one God. And what does that give us the power? That no human being has strength over us. Yes, we have to be civil. We have to be kind, we have to be gracious, but you don't own us. Avade atem veloy avade la avadim. You are servants, atem, your servant, you're my servants, God says, not servants of my servants. So you see from this, the word hod, the, the attribute of hod is actually also the secret to eternity. Because when somebody is a great person, as great as they are, we're all human beings, we're mortals, and we have our limits. You're only as great as you can be. But when you introduce and integrate into your life an element of humility, then you become as great as the thing that you're humble to. When you're dedicated to a cause greater than yourself, you become an extension of it. And that's what Yehudi and Hod introduces, the ability to be connected to something greater than yourself, commitment, dedication. And indeed, that is the secret, everybody wonders, the secret of Jewish survival. Why is it that all the great empires, the Egyptian empire, the Assyrian empire, the Persian empire, the Babylonian empire, the Greek empire, the Roman empire, you name it, the Spanish empire, they have no, no remnant is left. They were tremendous uh, superpowers with armies, with money, with land, with resources, nothing. The Jewish people, a bare 14 and a half million people today, who've been exterminated, have been killed, have been pillaged, have been expelled, have been oppressed over thousands of years, and we're still standing. Yes, we may have been hurt, we may be wounded, but we're here. What's the secret to that? So, you know, of all people, you know who gave us the answer? Balaam. Yes, the wicked prophet, the prophet that came to curse the Jewish people, he was hired, commissioned by Bullock of the Moabite the kingdom to curse the Jews. And instead of curses came out blessings. And one of the things he said, me mona offer Yaakov. Who can count the dust of Jacob? Meaning that he saw then and in the future that the Jews would multiply like dust and they'd be everywhere. But why is the word dust used? Which seems like a very negative term. So one of the explanations given is because dust is also symbol symbolic of humility. Dust is, on one hand, seems very lowly, but we don't feel that nafshi ka'ofer la koyaltiya, we say. My spirit is nafshi, is humble, like dust, like the earth. And that is why psach libi secha, when we're humble, it opens up our heart to receive something greater than ourselves. No human being can be immortal because we're all mortals, we're all finite, we're all temporary creatures. But when we commit Yehudi, when we commit with Hoyd to something that is eternal, then we become an extension of eternity. Am Yisrael Chai. Am Nitzchi. We are an eternal nation, not because of our strengths, not because of our brilliance, not because of our philosophies, not because of our money, not because of our ingenuity. It's because of our humility. Because when you're humble, 
no one can destroy. It's like they say that something is already humble, you can't humble it. Because the more you humble it, the stronger it becomes. Something that's arrogant, you can bring to its knees, which indeed is what happened to all these empires. They, they were built on the sword, they were built with arrogance, and they died in arrogance. And they fell in arrogance. Humility cannot be eliminated because humility by itself is essentially is a self abnegation in a healthy way that allows you to manifest, that allows you to channel eternity. So with all that said, what do we come away with? We come away with a beautiful, beautiful attribute that is critical in the spectrum. It's called the tapestry of our emotions. That without hoid, and that's why in each week we have a hoid, the hoid of chesed, the hod of Gvura, the hod of Teferis, the hod of Netzach, and now in the week of hod, and there's the hod of hod, that we have that feature that creates that element, and that's why indeed it's called, one of its names is called beauty. The most beautiful thing of all is when is the opposite of arrogance, is the opposite of pomposity, the opposite of, of being inflated with your ego and ability to acknowledge. Today, science, psychology's has been writing about much about the power of gratitude. Hoid, hoidoa, hoid, moidim, modani, gratitude. It's actually shown to make a person healthier, to add years to their lives, and many other factors, because gratitude actually releases certain chemicals within us. So it's interesting that this is now being demonstrated even on a scientific level. So in this week of Ho, that's what we focus on. Where do we stand with that? And it's not just a theoretical abstract thing. It comes down to exercises. In my book, I write on each day one of the exercises. So I'll just read one or two for this week of Hod, because remember, the week of Hod has seven days within it. So the chesed of Hod, the love within, in, within yielding or acknowledgement, there's the discipline within it, there's the compassion within it. So for Hod to be complete, it actually has to have all seven attributes. So I just will read one or two examples of how we can look at ourselves introspectively and come away with a way of evaluating where do you stand in the level of hod. And it makes it easier when you contrast it, as I mentioned earlier, with your determination, with your netzach. Netzach is the drive and hod is the yielding. So for example, when you're, let's say you're a boss and have workers working for you. So there's a time you need to motivate them. You need to give them a pep talk. You need to pressure them. You need the netzach, but you also need sensitivity. If you see someone is working hard, someone who may need a little time out, someone needs a few kind words. So Hod comes into play and introduces another dimension. And you'll see you'll have much more loyalty from your workers when they see not only that you could drive them and motivate them, but it could also be sensitive to them. They see that you're recognizing their, their, their humanity. And not just, they're not just machines. So when you contrast it with Netzach, you can start saying some of us, for example, are very strong in the Netzach side, but the Hod part is not so strong. So this is the week where you want to strengthen your Hod. Sometimes it's the other way around. Some people have very strong Hod. They know how to yield, but they don't know how to fight for themselves. Many of us are afraid of confrontation. So Hod is not meant to negate the deed at times where you do have to stand up for yourself. But that also is part of the, the humble experience. It's not a contradiction. So just to use a few examples, I'll, I'll begin, in the, uh, I'll take one where we talk about the level of hold. I'm looking in my actual book right now. So I'm reading straight from here. Humility is sensitivity. It is healthy shame that comes from recognizing that you can be better than you are and that you can expect more of yourself. In other words, it's not allowing yourself to deceive yourself through arrogance that you're better than you really are. It's recognizing, as one of the great sages said, that is knowing how small you are and how great you can become. Some people have illusions or delusions of grandeur. They don't know how small they are. Other people know how small they are, but they don't know how great they can become. So hod is really the balance between the two. So, Chesed of Hod, which was the first day of Hod earlier this week, where we examine the love in your humility. Healthy humility is not demoralizing. It brings love 
and joy, not fear. So humility is not cowering in fear and shrinking uh, or uh, retreating. Humility that lacks love has to be re-examined for its authenticity. Sometimes humility can be confused with low, low self-esteem, which would cause it to be unloving. So the exercise for that day would be, before praying with humility and acknowledgement of God, give some charity. It will enhance your prayers. In other words, the humility shouldn't just be one of yielding. It should have also love within it to make sure that it's a full-bodied emotion. One example. I'll take another one. Gevura of Hod, which is the second day in the week of Hod. Discipline humility. Humility must be disciplined and focused. When should my humility cause me to compromise and when should it not? This is something that needs discretion. It needs review. In the name of humility, do I sometimes remain silent and neutral in the face of wickedness? Humility sometimes can work against us in, in, if it's not used properly. Okay. And here the exercise for the day is focus on your reluctance to commit in a given area and see if it originates from a healthy, humble place. So I'll share a short story that I heard from an individual. When he was a, young, when he was a teenager, a student in the yeshiva, in the school, so his rebbe, his teacher, suggested that he go out to speak, to go and, and give a talk, a Torah talk, an inspirational sermon to a community. And he was reluctant to do so. He said, it's not for me. You know, I, I, there are better speakers, there are better orators, and so on. No, but the rabbi insisted. And the more he resisted, the rabbi finally said to him, he said like this, said, misplaced humility is rooted in arrogance. Sometimes we resist doing something, not because we're humble, but because we're afraid of failing. We don't do what we need to do. So there are times that humility is not meant to be weakness. It's not meant to say, I don't know how to do it. It means do it and know that the, that the gift, the blessing is coming from above. So misplaced humility can be rooted in arrogance. So you have to also evaluate that the humility should be balanced and know when to use it and when not to use it. Where it should be used is, of course, in situations where there's a disagreement and you see that yielding may be the way to solve the issue. So you say, I don't need to be right always. Sometimes we need to be kind. Sometimes we need to have love. And in that name, we sometimes do compromise things. But at other times, we have to know when compromise is not appropriate. And that, of course, requires a uh, review and evaluation. I'll, get, I'll do one more where I did Netzach Havhod, Netzach Havhod, which is interesting. The endurance, the determination of humility. So it says like this, examine the strength and endurance of your humility. Does my humility withstand challenges? Sometimes we're humble, but then when we're challenged, we may not be humble. Am I firm in my positions or do I waffle in the name of humility? So Netzach of Hoyt underscores the fact that true humility does not make you into a doormat, as I mentioned before. On the contrary, it gives you enduring strength. And here the exercise for the day would be, demonstrate the strength of your humility by initiating or actively participating in a good cause. In other words, if humility causes us not to be active, not to take initiative, not to be involved in something positive, then it's not a positive force. Then it's just another way of avoiding responsibility. Humility has to be a force that makes you more responsible, but doesn't allow you to become haughty or arrogant. So these are a few examples of what we do this week in understanding our inner hod, the hod within us. And indeed, look at any human being. You see a shining personality, someone that has that inner charisma, that inner sparkle. You'll always see there's a measure of humility that even when they succeed, they know how to defer. They know how to recognize and acknowledge others. They know how to share the glory. It's a feature that really makes us into something that's more than just human. It makes us something into what is divine. Which brings me back to the opening words I said, that sphera, you're not just counting days and weeks. Not just counting numbers. It's telling a story, a story of your life. And furthermore, it's illuminating. It illuminates your personality. So every day when we refine 
that particular respective emotion, that particular attribute, or the refining something is like polishing a diamond. So each of us are born with these seven emotions. They're part of us, but sometimes they can get rough at the edges. They can be undeveloped, like anything. And you need to refine them. So v'sfartem lechem, the mitzvah, to count, means to tell the story, v'sfartem, make them shine. Make your emotions shine that when someone looks at you, that you glow with an aura of beauty, of humility. You look at someone and say, ah, this is what a human being that God would be proud of. And each of us has that capacity. I'll conclude with the words of Michelangelo when he was asked, how do you sculpt those beautiful angels in the marble? He responded, I saw the angels trapped in the marble and I carved and carved and set them free. Interesting. In other words, beauty doesn't come from outside, from without. It comes from within. You, I, every one of us has that inner beauty within us. We have that shining personality. That's how we're born. But then life takes over and often it gets trapped. It gets covered up in marble, in concrete, in other substances. The real mission, the real purpose of the counting of the Omer, Omer Aliyah, is to elevate. And what? Not to create something new, but to strip away, to carve away the excess and allow that inner beauty to emerge. So with that, as we say every day when we count the Omer, the Hirat Son, may it be God's will, that on that respective day, may we focus with a proper soul search, a proper introspection, evaluating where we stand and refine, elevate, perfect, and make shine that part of your internal personality. And when we finish, all seven weeks, all 49 days, we're then ready to the marriage. That's what Matan Torah, the Shavuot holiday, is a marriage between heaven and earth, a marriage between God and the people. We're ready for the marriage because we prepared ourselves well. And we count it down with a yearning, with a longing, and we bring the best that we can possibly be. And that best is tremendous. It's not just who you think you are, it's what you can become. So may we all really use the, this day and this week and the following weeks as we continue this journey and this process. And again, I commend your, your work. I commend all of us here participating in this journey. And may we share it with others. And together, may our synergy actually tip the scales, as you put it earlier, and bring personal and global redemption. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Jacobson. That was really, really wonderful. And um, uh, you know that it's a good shield when you feel lighter at the end, when you're in a state of mochen, the godlud expanded consciousness. And that was just, that was really, really incredible. So on behalf of all of us, we so appreciate you carving out this time to share your wisdom, the Torah's wisdom with all of us uh, when it comes to Sefirah to Omer. Uh, for those of you who are watching the recorded uh, um, uh, um, video, we will see you next week for our Yusod Empowerment class. And uh, we'll see you soon. So now I'm going to stop the recording.